right, right, folks, this is Rabble Rousing Rich Bergeron. And Psychic Tom Padgett. Tarot cards ready to ready to be laid out and predict the future. Yes, and we have three events. No, two events for you to predict. <laughs> Bellator and UFC. Uh, we had a big one last week. I'm not sure if Tony gave us a prediction or not on that one. Speaking of predictions, but uh, Kovalev versus uh, it did. Uh, and, Alvarez. And then Tom didn't give me the ball because I was wrong as can be. Well, actually, you know, all we can say is Buddy McGirt earned Buddy, his yeah. team. I mean, he seemed to really get to Kovalev because you look at a guy in his mid-30s, He's not the same guy he was. He's, he he can't be that crusher, that intimidator anymore. Right, right. And a lot of guys, a lot of guys can't segue and lose that identity. And I wasn't convinced he could do it. But uh, apparently, he had an extensive amateur career, and uh, somehow, Buddy McGregor tapped into Kovalev's uh, image, his, his inner amateur skills, and uh, that was that was a performance, just a paint job with that jab, just a paint job. It was funny, um, in fact, I'm going to this, the um, fool I made of myself trying to get the, um, the, um, ESPN Plus over the weekend. Um, but, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm excited for the fight, I'm inviting some of my friends over, uh, they couldn't make it, which is kind of good because the fight ended up being so late, didn't realize that. They couldn't be like, you know, it's going to be on an app, but it's going to be on a what? Hmm. Like, how do you watch a fucking app? I'm not, I got a screenshot of this TV. I'm not watching the fight on my TV. And they're like, no, genius. You can watch it on your TV. Well, hack. It's on an app. So I'm arguing with people. Then I'm going on Facebook asking for advice. People are like, do you have a smart TV? Mm -hmm. I think it's high def. That doesn't mean it's a smart TV, Tony. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> they're like, do you, have, do you have a fire stick? And I'm like, well, I, 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 I made a fire the other day when it was like five degrees out and I threw some sticks and it uh, you know, made the damage you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like I'm like I'm getting frustrated and then, then someone's trying to help me over the phone I'm really getting frustrated so finally it's like you know what you have to do is you have to go and get a fire stick and you can plug it into your TV and you can download the app on that so now I'm frustrated so I go to I go to Walmart and I and I know I'm getting frustrated I'm right now. I'm not technically proficient. I'm an idiot. Um, so I need your help. And now I'm basically telling this guy, you can basically run run me in the coals here because you know you're going to tell me all this shit and you can overcharge the shit out of me. Because I'm telling you right now, I have no clue what I'm doing. I just want to watch this fight. And he, but he's cool enough. To keep he's like, no, listen, you don't need this top of the line. I'm telling him. He's like, what are you going to use this for? You know? And I'm like, I want a couple apps. I can watch fights. I know that they're doing the Dazna app or whatever it is, or Danza, and I know there's going to be some fights on there. All I want to do is watch some boxing matches. And there's one tonight, so I'm kind of at a last minute. He goes, okay, this is a me middle of the road, uh, Roku or whatever it is. It's a middle of the road uh, one. It's going to be for what you need, and blah, blah, blah. He told me what to do, and I went home, and I put the little thing into the back of the TV set with one of the HDMI thingamabobbers, and I downloaded it, and then I went to ESPN Plus, and I downloaded it, and I got the four ninety nine a month subscription, and I downloaded it, and I watched some goddamn fights. <laughs> and you know what? The production was clear as shit. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. Oh, we had a big 60-inch TV. We had, and you want to talk about, you know, some fights. That was a fight fan lover's night. <coughs> because... At 7 o'clock or whatever, they started a card from Fort Worth, Texas, and they started, there was nobody in the audience, but I don't care, the fights were good, <laughs> and I watched three hours worth of fights from 7 to 10 on ESPN+. Plus. Then it said, you know what, now I'll go to ESPN regular and watch another two hours of fights from the same venue, and I did, and it was good. <laughs> then I went back to the app, and they had two more fights. And then by the couple of the fights started at one in the morning, I was like, so I can't say that I was 
really in tune because I was kind of dozy. But, but from what I saw, he looked good. And he won almost every round. And I was happy. Hmm. Uh, not that it's so much that he won, just the fact that I was able to see the fight. Yeah. Um, but um, going back to what you were saying, Tom, regarding fighting the bear, um, with Kovalev, because he has three career losses, and he seemed to have almost an excuse for every loss. The first Andre Ward fight that he was winning, and it was a close fight, I overtrained, and I ran out of the gas, and my legs were dead near the end, and but I still should have won. Okay, okay, I'll take your argument. Then he gets beat again, and he ran, and he really got tired. Well, I was overtrained, and then he hit me with low blows. And were there low blows in there? Yeah, potentially they were on the belt line. But then it wouldn't have affected the ending because the ending was eminent. So, you got two situations <coughs> right now. now. you come to the third fight against Alvarez, uh, which was um, back in August. And well, I was there with my friend. My old friend's like, man, he looks like he's, he's spent after the sixth round. And he got dusted in the seventh. And he's like, well, I overtrained and I didn't have anything left. And I was really exhausted. And so, like, every time he's blaming somebody else, he's not taking accountability. I'm like, is this a guy that, you know, maybe has seen his better days? And he may have. Um, but also at the same time, he, he can't accept his losses. And he's making excuses. And that's one of the themes that they brought up. But he looked sharp under Budding Gert. And you're right. He maybe wasn't the crusher of old. But at the same time, he was was an effective, technical, well-schooled fighter. And he did what he had to do. He looked sharp over the whole fight. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe Buddy knew when to rein him in a little bit, saying, you know what? You know, you, maybe you can't spar full tilt like you used to. Maybe you can't run eight miles. you got to run six miles. Maybe you can't do this like you did because your body has aged. you got to change things. And it worked. Remember, when, when Buddy took over Arturo Gatti um, after uh, Gatti's loss to uh, Oscar De La Hoya, and Gatti had, had that very good run for a while, you know, there was give and take fights when he was um, junior lightweight champion at 130, and then, you know, he, was, he had lost the title, um, then he moved up in weight, no, he didn't lose the title, he moved up in weight, lost the angel and ready. Then he had two losses to um, Ivan Robinson, both great fights, but he can take a lot of punches. And then he got completely decimated by Oscar De La Hoya, and it's like, you know what, okay, his time is done. And then he comes back like a year later under Buddy McGirt, and he's fighting Sharon Malala, who was a former world champion, and he looked really good. I'm like, wow, it looks like, you know, you, 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 uh, you turn the clock back a little bit. out of this fighter at that stage of his career to extend things and just take it to the next level. The only thing I, I, I said about Buddy and my, my friend that I mean, have this discussion often is there were two fights that I think he should have swapped the game plan. And that was when he had um, um, Arturo try to um, box with Floyd Mayweather basically got him, you know, shredded. And then when he had him basically try to slug with a much larger Carlos Baldemir, and he just, you know, ground into the ground. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, but you really think it would have made a difference against Floyd. And I, and I, I agree with where you're coming from, your premise, but even if he went to war, you think it would have mattered. You know what? Um, with a total outcome, no. Floyd still would have beat him. Floyd still would have stopped him. But uh, if Arturo would have went in there and tried to fight a rough and tumble type fight, you know, Floyd would have countered him. Floyd would have probably, you know, ended up cutting him up and stopping him late. But he would have made some um, moments of uncomfortableness for Floyd. 
he would have, you know, got in there. He would have maybe he, um, tried to throw some wing and body shots in there, hit him on the shoulders, um, you know, be very be a physical fighter. I stand yeah, and, 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 yeah and, and, and I would say also a, a much more fan-friendly fight because if you're a, 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 a backer of Arturo, that fight was hideous. I mean, even after the third round, it was just looking... I wish I'd find a better word. What's another word for hideous? Hideous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, terrible, uh, atrocious. Disgraceful. Uh, you know, because uh, <laughs> one of our neighbors uh, ordered the fight that night. Uh, we were at a wedding um, right down the street. One, one neighbor had a big wedding in the backyard. Um, so we were at that until about 9, 9.30. And then another neighbor up the street was getting the fight. And they said, no, we want you to come over to watch this fight. We're like, okay. You know, and my dad and I, walk up there and we're watching it and as we're watching it we're like oh, like, yeah, like our, every time we they take this beating we were like actually starting to wince and um we um looked my dad my dad looked at me I looked at him in that terrible sixth round that horrible 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 brutal sixth round when God he was getting hit across the ring and he was walking in post holes and he was you know didn't know where he was and my dad says if they don't stop it at the end of this round, goes, I have to leave because I, I, I can't watch it. I've never heard him say that. I, I, I know. It was, it was, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I know where he was coming from, and it just seemed like nothing worked. Nothing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like I said, if he would have gotten in there, and I'm um, like, and the fact that I don't know, but, you know, look at the way. Um, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a blind his name right now. Not, not Hernandez, not Baldemir. Uh, the one guy that really gave Floyd um, two tough fights. Marcus Maidana later in his career, but earlier in his career. Um, right, I, I know, I know, I know who you're talking about. Right after the uh, uh, Diego Corrales fight. Yes, exactly. Um, and where's my mic? Oh, um. He went in there and he really gave Floyd a rough and humble affair. And right. if God would have fought maybe that style, he like said he, he like he likely would have won, he like he would have got cut up and stopped eventually. But, but he would have made most of uncomfortableness. Right, right. I mean, because uh, trying to outbox the boxer, I mean, you don't want to take on your opponent's strength. I mean, it is kind of, you know, uh, I mean, you make a good case for that, even though it wouldn't have probably mattered in the long run. But let's give your fighter the best shot. And then, um, then a couple years later, when he had the fight against Carlos Baldemir, Baldemir was a tough, physical, strong. He was a guy that was fighting at 147 pounds, but between fights, he's playing like 185, 190. You know, he was a big guy. And Arturo, we went to that fight, and he tried to stand right in front of him and slug with him. And it was like, you're faster than this guy. If you start boxing, Using that jab and hitting him from the outside, you have a good chance of winning, you know, a decision. Especially in Atlantic. But in the first round, he did great. Second round, he's standing in front of him, and we're like, damn, he got hit with another right hand. Damn, he got hit again. Damn, he got hit again. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he's starting to wear down, wear down, wear down. And then ninth round, it's over, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and uh, Toro did have some halfway decent boxing skills when he used them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, we had a bunch of other fights last weekend as well. Um, you, you said you saw pretty much every fight on this card, Tony? Um, how about uh, James Comey's little brother, Richard? How did he do? How did he look? <laughs> you know, I got to see Richard Comey play in person. Where, oh, that's funny, James Comey. I got to see him play in person um, when he lost to Robert Easter. Um, it, yeah, a couple years ago, and you know, tough fighter, but, you know, rough guy, and, and I mean, that performance he did the other night was a wow. You know, I mean, that that shot he hit him with was like, oh, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and then we had the somebody's else got to go fight of the week, and unfortunately, poor Carmine. He didn't get his 20th win. He got his first loss. 
Uh, Oscar Oscar Valdez picked up his 25th in the World Boxing Organization World Featherweight title. And then there was three, three titles up for grabs. No, no, no. You got to mention what Carmine got though. Oh, what he, happened? He got his first loss, but he also got uh, uh, an acceptance. You didn't see that. He got an acceptance from. Uh, he got down on one knee. An acceptance from his fiance. Oh really? He lost. Yeah, I do remember that. that. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was classic. You know, he may he may have lost, but uh, he called her in, dropped out on one knee, and she couldn't resist. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe she just didn't have the heart to disappoint him twice in one night. But, <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. He had a hard yeah, enough, and, yeah, and Valdez was so cool about it. He he wished he wished the newlyweds or soon to be weds all, all the best, but no, that was just that was that was kind of cool to see that. <laughs> and, and you know, it's just I always had a fantasy with the ring girls, but uh, best I could get was over. <laughs> um, we hadn't even got a phone number. They, they were usually from the local gentlemen's clubs, at my level. <laughs> 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 they were professional ring girls. But, I'll tell you what was funny, Tom, um, when I was going to, and I, and I want to give you guys an update in a few minutes, um, but after we get, um, you know, through the fight results, um, when I was going to box an exhibition fight a few months ago, and I told my friend Mike, who I grew up with, and I said, Mike, I said, I'm going to have you work my core. He goes, what? I said, yeah, I'll have you work my core. He's like, and, and you can see he's like questioning me on it. I'm like, dude, it's an exhibition. I'm going against one of my own fighters. You know, it's a fun and games type thing. I said, he's like, I've never worked in a corner of my life. I said, Mike, all you got to do is stand in there, give me a drink of water between rounds, and make sure I'm not trying to follow the cheerleaders or the ring car girls and get the phone numbers. <laughs> Jumping yeah, out of a cake at the next party. Rounds, you know, get your mind on the fight. Where you that was a Jorge Paez. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I posted a video today, um, being the 21 anniversary today of my historic fight with the greatest basketball player to ever. Oh, yes, Michael played. Jordan. Here's Michael Jordan. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I tell people I fought him. I had to fight him in the Nationals after after Tony schooled him. So I'm trying to let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it didn't help me any. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that old phrase? Guys are never the same after they fight me. <laughs> Michael Jordan weighed 185 pounds. <laughs> you know what? Actually, it's funny. It's like, um, when we fought at Black Kings, and I played, you know, that fight was, um, we were, I think we were fighting at 180 or 185, and I think I weighed 179, uh -huh. and he weighed like 176. Um, he was a few pounds less than me. Which, they said he was going to come in heavier. They were expecting him to come in like 181, 182. Yeah. And then,
And that day, I remember talking to Dr. Cox. He's like, Jordan only weighed, like, when he first weighed in at, like, 171 or 172. No, maybe even less than that. It might have been, like, 169 or something ridiculous, where he had to gain, like, six pounds <laughs> in a matter of, like, an hour. Jeez. So then he was, like, funneling water into, the, uh, you know, down his throat. And, you know, and he ended up, like, he got on the scale he made to 175, and then he actually threw up. Ugh. And I remember Dr. Cox pulling me aside and goes, Tim, you might be fighting tonight. We don't know. And if you are, we don't know who. You might draw a Jordan. If you do, we said, so we, he's like, I hope, we hope you get a bye, because we think you're the one that deserves it. But if you fight Jordan, you hit him in the body, he's probably going to fold in the first round. <laughs> and, of course, I drew just on that night. And I actually had him folding from body shots, but he clinched me with the 74 arms. Mm -hmm. and, and then he gets a decision because it was his home gym. Uh, and then the next night, he beats Jordan because Jordan gave him a better fight, but he still, you know, wasn't at his peak. Right. Yeah. yeah. All the old days. Yeah. It was good stuff. It was good shit. You know? We had some good, tough, tough opponents to deal with, but uh, definitely Jesse Bond was the dirtiest of all time. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you said, he had a bunch of arms, and you know, he clinched you with every one of them. Um, and, and it's funny, because like I said, Rich, I didn't go into the Nationals that year. Um, I was like, I don't care who I draw, you know, I'll fight anybody. But I said, you know, look at the list of the seven other competitors. I had either... What? There was, there was seven other competitors. I had fought, I think, three of them, and beaten all three of them, and and then saw two others or something like that. The only two that I had no scouting on going into that fight were you mm -hmm. and the guy one, the six foot seven guy. Oh, so I, I said, I'll hold anybody first round, and then because because you guys were going in a basically a higher bracket because you had won your respective regions, I knew I was going to draw either you, Jesse Bond again, Slatton from Air Force, or um, the Kentucky kid that got a bye and got into the Nationals. And I said, like, uh, I knew I would murder him, um, and I knew I'd already beaten Jesse Bond, and in a neutral, grand, neutral arena, he would never beat me again. I said, if I could draw one of those two, I'd feel more comfortable. That would give me a night to at least scout you or um, um, Slatton. Because I had, and I, I apologize, the other guy that I fought not beaten, I'd beaten Jesse Bond, I'd beaten Michael Jordan, I did not get the win over the um, uh, Reno kid, Kerr. You know, we fought a split decision. And he got in his home arena. That's the kid you ended up beating. Yeah. Because of my inside information. Because you inside info. Yeah. Nobody was nice enough to tell me that. You know? I'm going there. I'm going to Talk about WWE I, I, stuff. Like that that's a Vince that's a Vince McMahon episode right there. Yeah. I gotta I'll, yeah, I gotta I'll eat the shit out of him. Well you know, and why I, I mean, when I got Reno to fight him, um and I remember going into the weigh in and there was a big article on the wall just about him and how he was coming to over company that adversity with his foot problem and how he got a big win over an Air Force fighter and all this that. And I'm like, you know, knowing how like competitive a lot of these, you know, teams can be, it's like you're like, oh, what? I can't, you know, all the publicity that he has bad feet. I'm like, you know what? And and, and I, he was a nice guy to me. He was very gentlemanly to me. But when you're on a team with somebody, you know, like being a lock haven guy, you might meet a guy on my team, but like, you know, he's the nicest guy in the world. He was a cool ass guy. I really liked him. This and that. And I was trying to remember, like, dude, I was a teammate with me. He's a dick. <laughs> One of his teammates was like, you know what? He's high on himself. He's a dick. I don't want to see him go anywhere. You know what? Hey, you find him first, like you, 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 come here, come here. <laughs> <laughs> Jab and move. He'll make a little bit of a buffoon. Yeah, basically, they, they told me that his feet were born on the wrong side. All you gotta do yep. is move side to side and keep your distance, and they win the fight. And 
Really, I don't remember a lot of that fight. I mean, not because it was uh, so easy, but just because it, it, it's, uh, he didn't really hit me that hard. I didn't give him a chance to. <laughs> I moved everywhere, and uh, it worked. It worked. And the one guy, one judge came up to me after the fight, and he goes, you know what won you that fight? And I wanted to say, I oh, the advice I got beforehand. <laughs> but I didn't tell him that, because he's a judge, you know? So he comes up, and he goes, no, it was, it was your jab. You know, your jab won you that fight. You got to use that in the next round. And of course, it was a fight where I didn't need a jab. I needed my inside fighting. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I'll tell you what's funny. Um, the, way that I, the way that I was trained, and going into the, the next one, when I heard a guy was second in the first round, I had no scouting on him, not realizing that he was going to see, he would step to an angle and then become a third. Um, and I had a hard time countering that, especially because I was having um, some issues with um, damage to my one knee. Um, but one of, one of my game plans was like, figure out a punch and, and then take it from him. So if you go back and you watch my fight against Jordan, the fight just posted today, you know, obviously no one who's taller than me. And, and a lot of guys will look to fight me from the outside because of my um, physical strength on the inside. So my goal was to take his jab away. So it was a catch and counter. I'm catching his jab, I'm sticking mine in his mouth, and then to him to, you know, fight me close which was to my advantage. Um, Jesse Bonds, when I saw him, was like, I knew he was like a mauler on the inside, but he would like to clutch a lot. So when you extend your arms to uh, kind of clutch around the guy, I'm dropping my body up, and I'm throwing my hook around the thigh, the cage, and I'm bringing right the uppercut to the solar plexus, and I'm grinding you down in the body. Um, you know, that's how... Now, that thing, um, Art Curry, who you beat in, in the regionals, I never fought Art, but I watched him, and he's a very physical, strong, I like to fight inside of the body, so with a guy like him, I'm going to let him come to me, and I'm actually going to, even though he was taller, I'm going to hit him, drop to the body, pivot out, hit him, I hit him with much to the body at all, to tell you the truth, I was a headhunter in that fight. Yeah. I hooks all day, and jabs, and right hands, and... Boy, he, he was beat up after that fight because he was totally, yeah. totally convinced after after making me quit in that scrimmage that all he had to do was wear me out in the body. And yeah. <laughs> it's a big mistake. <laughs> I was in shape this time. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, like, can you beat a guy like the first time? And like, especially in a person's mind, if like, you know, say, say you and I fight and, and I have the advantage perfect examples when I fought the um, other BMI kid down at BMI um, or at Richmond, uh, Willie Taylor. And, you know, Willie came at me for a round and then I started, you know, taking it to him and then I, you know, really ran him over the coals the second and especially the third round. Now, say we fight again in the Nationals that year, I'm already walking in and thinking, it was easy last time. It was easy. You know, I'm not going to, I'm just going to go in there. I'm going to do what I did. And I'm not going to problem. That was kind of the mistake I made against Jesse Bond. Mm. Was the first fight. It was because I was the one throwing all the punches. He was more like holding and mauling and clutching. And, and I'm hitting him at will. And then I went to do that copy at it. And he caught me a few times in the first round where he clearly won that first round. Which in the first fight, I don't think he won any round. Hmm. Uh, and then the second and third round. And then I'm like, oh shit, I got to get back on my game because I just threw a round away. Um, because I thought it was going to be the same blueprint as last time, and he changed it up. I had to rechange it, but by the time, you know, I did that, I already gave away that first round, and with the one judge giving him the second round, I was, I was, you know, really toast. It is what it is, you know? Yeah, memories. Take this, uh, because I do, I do want to bring this up. Um, I do want to, um, you know, give a um, shout out tonight um, to my good friend Hank Sisko. Um I know he's on the road to recovery, and last week he was in, um, you know, rehabilitation facility, and he started running a fever. They had to bring back 
the hospital. I went to see him on Sunday, a Super Bowl Sunday. I went in the afternoon, and uh, the first time I went to visit him a couple of weeks prior, there was a lot of people in the room, and he was singing, and he was talking to people, and he was getting ready for his procedure, and all this and that. Um, but this time, you know, he, he, I just got there, he was sleeping, but he was um, on antibiotic for the, the fever and uh, whatever else he had, so really wasn't feeling well. He was cold, he was shivering, and um, he was actually throwing up. At one point, I had to wave a nurse down because I was worried he was going to choke. Um, but, you know, I've been checking, you know, with his family, and he does a local TV show at the high school. He's been doing it for years. But that's a way to help teach the kids audiovisual, and he is so charismatic that they could put they could put a, um, a log as his guest, and he's going to make the show good. Mm-hmm. So they have had booked me um, months ago for this week, and, and I remember talking to his daughter the other day. I'm like, "Well, do you guys still want me on? I mean, do you, are they still doing anything?" We're like, "Well, they still got to do the class. They still got to teach these kids." And I was kind of hesitant. And I'm like, "Well, I don't know." And you know, and, and, and I was conflicted. And then Tuesday, he did this thing called me, and she goes, "We're uh, confirming you for tomorrow." And I said, "Well, are we still doing it? You know, with him not being on?" She goes, "Listen." She's like, the guy that teaches the class has been stepping in, and we need you. He's like, we really need somebody that's got a big personality that can really help make the show interesting in his absence. And they said, you know, can you bring your A game? <laughs> I, said, I said, all right. And, and you guys know me. I've never met a microphone I didn't like. Um, and when you get on the show with Hank, Hank always like, make it like show and he'll bring some photos in. We'll show the photos. And we use that as our point of discussion. So when you go on a show with him, they tell you. You go on there, he's going to go, start off with a topic, and then he's going to go on a lot of tangents, try to keep up with them. I'm like, okay, I can do that. As you guys know, I can. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy that is taking over a show was like, I, I can you bring in like talking points and questions you want me to ask? I said, listen, I got this. <laughs> and I brought a picture, and I, and I tied everything together, and I centered it around Rocky, not Marciano, Balboa. And, and what I did was to keep the show moving, um, you know, I showed up in a red silk shirt. And I said, this is the most supple attire I've ever worn on the show. <laughs> <laughs> For a sequel to you know, in the Philly outfit, you know. Um, but I brought in the picture of me and Bert Young in my Phillies outfit tie into Rocky. Then I said my original game plan was to actually bring the hat on the show and retire it on the air. But the guy making my new one uh, actually happened to use it as a template design. So I don't have to retire on the air. I said, but that'll come later. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a picture with the guy who was a former guest on the show that um, is making my outfit. I had a picture of Hopin when I bumped into Hank at a, he was having dinner at a, a, a bar. And I'm dressed as Rocky. So we did a photo together, like Rocky and Mickey, and I brought that in. Um, I had, a, you know, a, a photo of, you know, him with my, my team of fighters, uh, Matt, the police officer, Amy, the girl, my friend Mike. So we tied that in. And then, of course, uh, we had a still shot of Creed 2 when I announced that I was the real star of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, we made a hand hour good and it's going to be on YouTube in a few days and I will send you guys the link. <laughs> well, and you, please, and you please tell me if I did as good as I think I did. Alright. <clears throat> well, we've been going down our own memory lanes here, but uh, well, how is Hank doing now, Tony? <clears throat> well, wish him, you know, well in his recovery. Um, well, as I heard, you know, I checked with his daughter and I know a couple of the kids from the audiovisual class are planning a visit to see him next week and that's a good sign um you know his daughter was gonna you know she was gonna give him the message that you know we did the show and we you know kind of gave him a, a big shout out in it we told him how much we missed him and he's gonna be very happy when he sees it so she's gonna go and um that's about as much as i got i'm gonna text her again tomorrow just for any further updates if um if he's out of the hospital or if he's back in rehab or you know what he's doing now um before you guys Sick last week um, with the high fever. Um, I checked in and they said, you know, he's in the rehab and he's fighting every day. He just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Then he had a setback. So we're just hoping 
that, you know, you still got that, you know, charismatic personality and that fighter spirit, as Yolk says. Keep bobbing and weaving, keep your hands up, keep your ass off the canvas, <laughs> and never lost the fight in the dressing room. And one of his uh, mantras is, uh, and I'm going to send you guys an article about him, um, he, one time during his fight career, he saw an opponent that, you know, he's like, look at this guy, there's no way I can beat him. And his, and his trainer was like, yelling at him, was like, no, you get in there and you get everything you've got. You can't, you know, just give up in the dressing room. And he went out there and he beat him. You know? He goes, you never lose a fight in the dressing room. He goes, you, if you're going to lose, you go out there, you give everything you've got, you give 100%, and you know what? And, and, and that makes you a winner. But no matter what happens, you're a winner. Keep on and weaving. All right. Yeah, well, we uh, wish him best. And, uh, yeah. Keep an eye on. Uh, in addition to the big fight card there with uh, Kovalev, we also had uh, Sergio Garcia getting the big win over at the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London. Uh, and proves 29 and 0 there over Ted Cheeseman. Cheeseman didn't bring the fight, I guess. Uh, he was pretty cheesy. <laughs> 15 and 0 going in, but uh, 15 and 1 now. And Garcia gets the EBU. European Super Welterweight title. So there you go there. And uh, <coughs> Felix Cash got a win in the co-main event there. Cashed in. <laughs> uh, 11, and 11 wins now, no losses. Uh, Rashid Abolaji was his opponent at middleweight. Lost to 11-5-1. That was for the big and Commonwealth middleweight title. And then we got next week. Pretty much those are the big fights from last week. Uh, let's see what we got next week here. Uh, there's one up in Ontario, Canada. Cody Crowley, 16 and 0, and Stuart McClellan, 25, 2 and 3, for the Canada Professional Boxing Council International Super Welterweight Title. Yeah, uh, that's I never heard of this Canada Canada Professional Boxing Council. This must be new. Uh, but they also have a national, not only the international but the national super welterweight title on the line. Two, two titles. And uh, nothing spectacular on the undercard. Let's see. I got one other big fight coming up. Oh, we had uh, we had Jim Comey's brother. Now we got uh, um, Bob Mueller's brother, Rico. Rico Mueller. Okay, hey guys, I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, to wait, it's, uh, Rico is funny because, you know, racketeering influence can corrupt organizations. <laughs> <laughs> Rico Mueller. That's <laughs> M-U-E-L-L-E-R. 24-2, fighting in Berlin, Germany, with one draw as well. He's got one loss in his last six fights. Fighting Betul Ushona, who's 36-7-1. And, one. and uh, that's not even the main event, but it's the best fight on the card. And somehow, uh, you know, guys with records like that are fighting, but the main event is a 6-0 and guy fighting a 15-3 and guy for the WBC International Light Heavyweight title. <laughs> Crazy. Well, I, I guess on this show, we have reported worse. <laughs> right. can't, can't say that would be good, but we have heard worse. Maybe we can uh, get our mismanagement. We, so far, I guess that's it, but it's kind of lukewarm. I think we can do better. What do oh, you yeah, think? definitely. We will, we will get, uh, last week, oh, by the way, last week we had, uh, we had a guy who got his 100th loss. <laughs> I don't know if he's celebrating or not, but it's against yeah, the guy who's making, uh, who was looking for his first win. He's a 0-1 guy. And so, one guy gets his first win, the other guy gets his 100th loss. And uh, with a hundred loss, do you remember his record? How many wins do he have? Ah, uh, jeez, I'll have to look at Saturday again. I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll find it. I will find that. But as far as this week goes, let's see, we got we got one here in Mexico with. Mentioning, I didn't even have the weights on here, but Daniel 
Baladeras, 18-1 versus Gilbert Gonzalez, 13-0-1. That's the main event, and there's no other fights finalized on that one yet. Your Asian Boxing Parliament lightweight. <laughs> this is in Russia. They must have just made this one right up for this fight. Uh, Pavel Malakov is fighting for this title. Uh, he's 14 and 1, fighting Vage Sarakhanian, who is 19 and 2. The Eurasian Boxing Parliament lightweight title. New one. Come that's events. quite a title. That is really quite a. That's, that's impressive. Well, one of the belt would say that. <laughs> cool me, uh, <laughs> Alexander That'd be a, a pretty big belt buckle, you know? Yeah. Alexander Ivanov in the co-main event of Super Bowl Weight 16 and 4 fighting Konstantin Ponomarev, who is 34 and 1. Also, another fighter with a lot of fights at his weight class, Denis Shafakov. At lightweight, 40 wins, 4 losses, 1 draw. Fighting Guy Batula Godzhialev, who is 6 and 1. That seems like a mismatch, but. You never know in Russia. There's 15 and 0 versus 11 and 31 from Spain in the main event. That's sort of a mismatch. How about this guy? His name is Prince Lee Isidore. <laughs> Prince Lee, get it? Lightweight, 16, 3 and 1, fighting Anthony Armas, who is. Is nine and three for the vacant WBF international lightweight title. This is in Trinidad and Tobago. That's their main event. And uh, uh, the co-main event is heavyweight. This could be our mismatch of the week here. Uh, Twenty-four and twelve. Kurtzen Manswell fighting Kenneth Bishop, who is two two and one. <laughs> Five fights to his credit, fighting a guy with twenty-four wins. Yeah. That's rough. Then you get the next fight, a uh, 16 and 8 fighter fighting an 0 and 3 fighter. Tough, tough break there. And then we go over in the United Kingdom. We have a guy who has more of a name of a poet than a fighter, James Tennyson. He is 22 and 3, fighting Gary Neal, who is 10 and 0. And that's their main event there. Uh, co main event is lightweights Fiergal McCrory. He is 9 and 0, fighting Carl Kelly, who is 2 and 2. Oh, that's Tony's, Tony's cue to come back. <laughs> through the um, matchups this week all over the world here. We're in uh, actually uh, the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland here. There's a fight card. Um, we've got uh, a couple good fights on this one. we got uh, Super Featherweight James Tem Tennyson. Just got through that one. Uh, and we've also got uh, Paul Highland Jr. fighting uh, on home soil. He had a bunch of fights over here in the U.S. He is a 19 and 1 fighting Miroslav Serban, who is 10-1. And and we got a good Irish name here. Tommy McCarthy at Cruiserweight, 12-1, fighting uh, Jerry Sivasina, who is 13-33. About that, that record. And then you got another guy. This is all Irish fight here. This is a good one. Super Featherweights, Matthew Fitzsimmons. He's 3-1. His opponent, Jamie Quinn, has four wins, 75 losses, <laughs> two draws. Whoa. And, and how many draws? 
Two. How many? How many? Two draws. Oh, two draws. Okay, two, two draws. So it's a, must have been a wild, a wild controversial draw. <laughs> uh, and then we have the big fights on Showtime uh, from Carson, California. Uh, super featherweight Javonta Davis, Floyd Mayweather protege there. 20-0, he's fighting Hugo Ruiz, who is 39-4. That's for the WBA Super World Super featherweight title. Super World Super. <clears throat> Next year they're going to call it the Super World Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> the Super World Super featherweight title. Okay. Because it's super featherweight, that's why. All right. But it's the super world title. <laughs> that's just confusing. Uh, so this is a big fight here. And uh, obviously, Javonta is going to try to stay undefeated. And Ruiz is going to show that, you know, the losses were the fluke. You know, so. See how this one goes. But uh, also, Ishe Smith on this card. He's 29 and 10 at super welterweight. Fighting Erickson Lubin, who's 19 and 1. Uh. Meetings coming up, you know, the loss to the Charles, Jamal, I can't remember which one. Um, you know, that really, it was a first round knockout. And this is a good opponent, you know. Um, E.J. Smith is tough, he's durable, um, you know, he's got skills. So, you know, and at the same time, he's closer to the end of his career. But but at any night, he can put on a great performance. So now it's like, um, you know, you, you come back, you want to test yourself against, you know, a, a good opponent, and, and you know, um, this is a good, good way to come back. Right. Also, at lightweight, Sharif Boguer, he is 32-1, and one, fighting Javier Fortuna, 33-2-1. and one. That's a great fight at lightweight. Super lightweight, Swan Haraldez and Eddie Ramirez going at it. Haraldez is undefeated 15 and 0. Ramirez is 17 and 2. And then we have uh, Mario Barrios, undefeated 22 and 0, also super lightweight. Fighting Richard Zamora, who is 19 and 2. And if that ain't enough, we've got a nice, decent featherweight fight. Angelo Leo, also 15 and 0. Fighting Alberto Torres, who is 11, 1, and 3. I've never seen a name spelled like this. I've heard of people named Genesis, but it's with G-E-N-I-S-I-S. -I -S. Uh, Labranza is the last name. 17 and 1 at Flyweight, fighting Gilberto Mendoza, who's 11, 6, and 2. Yeah, those are the big, big ones on that card. And we got another fight in California, Indio, California, put on by Oscar De La Hoya. The main event there is uh, Ray Vargas. Undefeated at 32-0, fighting Franklin Menzania, who's 18-4 for the WBC World Super Bantamweight title. And then we have Alberto Machado, also undefeated, 21-0, fighting Andrew Cancio, who is 19-4-2. Now it's the WBA World Super Featherweight title. And we have Joseph Diaz, 27-1, fighting Charles Huerta, who is 20-5. And one more worth mentioning here, Oscar Duarte at lightweight. He is undefeated, 15-0-1, fighting Adrian Estrella, 28-3. Alright. Well, this is, a, this is a kind of funny name for a fighter. Roger Belch he is 11-1, fighting Seidel, Seidel Blocker, who is 1-10-1. <laughs> this is this is a yeah. That's a uh, fight from Norfolk, Virginia. And we know how screwed up Virginia is lately. If you've been re watching the news, <laughs> <laughs> one ten and one. You know, I'm so tired now from all this tax stuff. I'm building a pyramid in my mind here. You know, <laughs> one ten and one. Oh boy. Oh, that's Virginia for you. We also have a guy who's one sixteen and zero on the card. A guy who's three twenty four and one, 
And another guy who's 13, 23, and 1. Fighting a guy who's 22 and 2. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately, in the news this week, we, we heard a lot about the guy in uh, Virginia, the governor there. He won't, won't step down. Yeah. So, uh, underneath his picture in the yearbook, this, he's now saying isn't him. Okay, totally racist, either which guy you pick. <laughs> You're either the guy in the Ku Klux Klan outfit or the guy in blackface. So, uh, he, either way he picks, he's screwed. But anyway, it says right underneath the picture, alma mater, Virginia Military Institute. So, it makes VMI look bad. But, uh, you know. Some might say that Virginia Military Institute having uh, the, every cadet set up that they have to salute Stonewall Jackson is a pretty racist <laughs> thing. But, hey, everybody has their own idea of racism. But I was just like, oh, geez, that makes me I look bad having that put on that guy's page right underneath that picture. <laughs> it's not, not why it should be in the news. stuff. And then they go and uh, try to figure out his replacement, and then he gets caught up in a scandal. Crazy news. Crazy news. Anyway. I was gonna mention this guy on Saturday. I'm gonna find him. Uh, before you got back on the call, Tony, I was telling Tom, there's a guy who actually celebrated his 100th loss last weekend. <laughs> wow. He was going in uh, 15, 99, and 5 was his record. Over five draws. Saxon, Germany. And his super middleweight is the main event, believe it or not. Uh, 15, 99, and 5 was his record. He fought Hamude Ayub going in at 0, 1, and 2. And, and Hamude got his first win. <laughs> Gurky gets his 100 loss. Mason Gurky, 15 at 99 and 5. So congratulations. Well, I, I, I imagine <laughs> uh, he's on the um, speed dial of a lot of promoters when they need someone at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, the guy like that who's taken a lot of fights, you know, if he's in that opponent category, and you can probably go, you can give, give you some rounds out with that. <laughs> Nuts. All right. So, let's go to some of the stories, some of the news we've got here before we switch over to MMA for our previews and um, one results card. You got to go through. Did you hear the um, sad story out of Austin today? That, um, Rocky Lockridge. Rocky Lockridge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the stories. I was going to get to here. Just read it, actually. It just came through. Uh, I, I heard a couple of things ago that they were taking a place to work. Um, you know, Rocky, he was a world champ. He was a tough fighter. Um, he had a one-round knockout of Roger Mayweather. Um, great right-hand puncher. Um, but he, he had his life in life. And, and um, for substance abuse, um, you know, maybe put him down a... a um, down the spiral, he battled homelessness, and um, so he, um, he had, you know, suffered a, um, a stroke, and they had him in a rehabilitation service, and he had been okay for a while, and sadly, um, he was starting to become, a, he couldn't swallow anymore, he was becoming asphyxiated, um, he was having breathing shoes, and there was just so many things where um, there was nothing more they could do, there was no chance of running. So they took him off last before, and he passed away today at the age of 60. Well, uh, I'm reading an article about him now. Um, he was uh, was on the A and E show Intervention. They also did another segment on him. Um, actually, you know, somebody from Alex Alex. Uh, I'm a blank on the last name, last name, but um, he sent me something. Uh, he was from the Retired Boxing Boxers Foundation. I don't know if they still do stuff, but... Uh, yeah, you need Alex Ramos, is it? Alex who? Not Ramos, is it? Yeah, Alex Ramos. He, he sent me the first mm -hmm. thing I ever saw in Rocky, Lockridge. And uh, it was... 
you know, it was like when the guy was trying to actually get back into boxing to help him get over his addictions, and uh, he was starting to hang around the gym. And everything looked promising, of course, but, you know, the cameras go away, and shit just goes back to normal. So, he basically, he was on uh, intervention, he had his, his uh, chance to reconnect with his kid that he hadn't seen in forever, and, and it seemed like he was on the straight and narrow, but, you know, as a street will do to you. They chewed him up and spit him out after his career, but he, he did pretty well in the ring, and uh, well, probably most well-known for giving Roger Mayweather his first loss with a first-round knockout in 1984, and that got him the WBA World Super Featherweight title, um, and he got the IBF Super Featherweight title before retiring with a 44-9 and record back in 92. And, uh, so, he's been had battles with crack cocaine and, um, you know, dealt with all kinds of uh, issues from living on the streets. He was homeless for a long time. Um, he was also an alcoholic for a brief period, you know, or throughout it all. So, anyway, unfortunately, lost a great champion. Just gonna turn it around. And uh, another boxer here. This is a great story. Uh, interesting. Uh, James DeGale. He yeah. is uh, fighting uh, Chris Eubank Jr. And he's been involved in boxing at some capacity since he went to his first gym at age 10. But um, he's really concerned, James, again, about uh, drug testing and uh, performance-enhancing drugs in boxing. He asked, uh, they asked him about Dylan White's request for long-term VADA drugs testing in the build-up to his proposed fight with Anthony and Joshua recently. He started by explaining his own experiences. He says, that's what happened for me and Andre Durrell. Al Heyman actually paid for the VADA testing. I'm on the UK, UK AD 365 days per year testing program. I've got to choose an hour of every single day. Mine's 8 o'clock in the morning. I got tested last week, but the last time they randomly done me was in November. Uh, if I had no fight announced and they knock on my door, if I'm not there, that's a strike. If I get a couple strikes, you're gone for three years. UKAD, which is UK Anti-Doping, under WADA rules is very different to that of VADA, Voluntary Anti-Doping Association. VADA is often perceived to be the gold standard in the sport, appearing to record the most failed tests, hence why White is so intense on ensuring they cover his bouts. In recent years, fighters such as Canelo Alvarez, Billy Joe Saunders, and Luis Ortiz have all failed VADA drug tests. Despite this, the Gale believes there is a far wider problem at hand. Believe it or not, performance-enhancing drugs is rife in the sport, he continued. There's so many people over the last couple of years that have been done. Trust me, it's rife in America. It's, in America, it's mad. It's crazy. I speak to Pauli Malignaggi. He's part of my team now. When I sit down and speak to him, it's mind-boggling. Some of the stuff he knows, some of the stuff he tells you, and some of the stories he knows. It's so interesting. And uh, also the punishments, uh, he thought. He says, uh, pretty weak. He says, you should be banned for life. If you get found out, you should be banned for life. It's dangerous, man. Boxing is a dangerous sport already. So when you're putting stuff in your body that's making you stronger, more powerful, hit harder, train harder, it's crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Somebody speaking out about it. <clears throat> From the inner ranks. Um, oh, yeah. That's, I never heard of that theory that they're purposely, you know, bagging these fighters on, on, for the VADA. They're, you're getting more tests positive than anybody else. I never heard that claim, but I don't know whether that's good or bad. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. That's what we got. 
the good, the bad, and the dirty. This article is uh, talking about the week in boxing here. Sergey Kovalev. Tio, we didn't even talk about the other card fight. Tio Fimo Lopez um, made the wow. first uh, 11 fights of his career look pretty easy. Never went past the sixth yeah. round and won nine by stoppage. And Diego Magdaleno was supposed to be his test. Um, obviously, he passed it. He won by seventh round knockout. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, it got a little controversial at the end um, when he finally dropped with his monster left hook and he then like, stood over him and made those like, he did like a shoveling motion, like he was shoveling dirt on him. And uh, Magdalena's corner had to be restrained because they were pissed. You know? And, yeah, it's one thing about being excited. You know, it's about one thing about, you know, bringing showmanship to the sport. Another thing about showing up your opponent. Um, and, you know, that, is, uh, that in a way, can hurt you because it kind of, you know, um, you know, gives a negative connotation to you and fans' eyes. It's like, you know, going into that fight, I'm like, wow, man, this kid's really an upcoming kid. I really want to follow him. I really want to like him. Uh, then I watch that, and I'm like, man, that was kind of a really dick of a move, you know? Um, but I'll definitely be watching him again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he uh, right now is, is a fighter. He's a, he's a must-see fighter. He's a fighter to put on your radar. Right. Uh, and also, uh, I didn't really mention Javonta Davis, who's fighting this weekend. Uh, his opponent, Hugo Ruiz, is a last-minute replacement for Abner Mares. And he put, not only pulled out of the fight, but um, said it was an elbow injury uh, last week. But now he's revealed that he suffered a detached retina in his right eye in a sparring session on January 23rd. And he had surgery last Wednesday to repair the eye. Uh, it's obviously career-threatening, but, um, you know, he says he's going to return someday. Uh, but he's also still leaving the decision up to the doctors after the procedure's done. And, uh, you know, he holds up. So this is the second time he has suffered the same injury. It happened also in 2008. Um, but he's also won four world titles in three different weight classes since then. So uh, and apparently uh, healed long enough for that to happen. Uh, but, you know, it's a big decision for him. Career or, you know, future or career. Could be. Just choose them one or the other. All right. So that's it for that one. Huh? So Khabib has not given up on uh, the Conor rematch. He, he did say previously that there's no reason for one, but now he's saying uh, this shit is not over. It's not. Uh, this is exactly that quote. Especially when you keep running your mouth. <laughs> this fight will happen in the street, in the parking garage, under a bridge. <laughs> this is what he said to hey, TMZ. But. I guess not in the cage. Anyway. Um, speaking of Conor McGregor, he is uh, having his name thrown around a lot by everybody who seems to win uh, one of these fight nights. Uh, the main event the last time it was Cowboys. No, it was, I don't think it was a main event, but Cowboy Cerrone in uh, beating his opponent really lobbied himself for a Conor McGregor fight. And now we have uh, Jose Aldo back in the picture looking for a big rematch. And uh, he looked very impressive in the co main event the other night of uh, UFC Fight Night. I didn't unfortunately get to watch it because I totally forgot this fight card was even happening. I was on my way up to um, Maine Saturday and uh, just totally blew my mind that this fight was going on. And, uh, by the time I thought about it, it was over. Uh, Marlon Moraes won the main event by a guillotine choke submission, 3 minutes and 17 seconds into round one. 
and uh, Raphael Asensio uh, falls to 27-7. Moraes gets his 23rd win, and but Jose Aldo won, uh, won the fans back with a TKO in the second round, 44 seconds in over Renato Carnero. Uh, did you get to see this one, Tom? No. No. Where but uh, I, I've seen the highlights, and um, Reyes is, um, boy, he's, he's right there. You know, I said before, after he finished Jimmy Rivera, he was definitely, there was no just top three guys in the bandway division, top four. And he just looked fabulous. And uh, we had Demian Maya prove it's better to be lucky than Lyman Good. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's his name, Lyman Good. He lost by Renegade's submission two minutes and 38 seconds into the fight. And Demon Maya, as we said last week, you know, he's just like a backpack, so he's going to get on you. And, and he did. <laughs> he obviously capitalized this time. Didn't waste any time. Charles Oliveira, another uh, submission expert, the Brazilian superstar, got his big win as well over David Tamir by Anna Carter Choke this time. 55 seconds into the second round. And uh, our favorite fighter named Johnny Walker. Got this big win over <coughs> Justin Ledette. And uh, what a fitting win for a guy named Johnny Walker. 15 seconds into the fight, he hit a spinning back fist and uh, punches to finish off. So, yeah, and I, I don't believe Johnny Walker speaks much English either. That's what makes that <laughs> name even more uh, incongruent than yeah. one of the day. Johnny Walker. Walker. Probably doesn't even drink either, right? <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a common name in Brazil. No. Johnny Walker. And we got Livin uh, Souza beating Sarah Frota by split decision. Marcus Perez beat Anthony Hernandez. Also by Anaconda Choke. Was a popular choke that night. That was in the second round, one minute and seven seconds. In, and we had Mara Romera Borella beating Kayla Santos in the other female fight of the night. That was a, a also a split decision. Uh, we had Tiago Alves beating Max Griffin by split decision. Jerzino Rosenstruck beat Junior Albini by TKO head kick and punches there. 54 seconds into the second. Uh, Geraldo de Freitas Jr. beat Felipe Descoleras by unanimous decision. And then we had uh, lots of spinning stuff, too, for the knockouts. Ricardo Ramos went down to Saeed at Nurmagomedov by TKO from a spinning back kick and punches. Two minutes and 28 seconds into the first. First fight of the night was Rogerio Bontran beating Magomed Bibulatov by split decision. And then we got big UFC 234 fight coming up this weekend. Uh, Robert Whitaker fighting Kelvin Gastelum. And this is in uh, Whitaker's area, Victoria, Australia. He comes in at 20 wins, 4 losses, and Gastelum comes in at 15 and 3. And uh, he's, he's been a little bit up and down. But had his issues with the drugs, and uh, seems to be he's back solid now. <laughs> So we'll see how he Yes, is. he is, but, but I, I get the feeling that the champ is going to make the hometown very happy. Well, Gastelum will not want it to go to decision, that's for sure. Now, uh, Comey's event is a little bit more interesting. We have the understudy versus the example here. Anderson Silva fighting Israel Aranya. And uh, Israel reminds a lot of people of Anderson with his dynamic style, but... Anderson is the original, so yeah, 34 and 8 versus 15 and 0 here. And uh, it's, it's been a long time for Anderson. Yeah. He hasn't been know, it, it, it's, like, it's like my heart is saying one thing and my head saying something else. If you get my draft. Right. <laughs> you know. So we'll see. We'll see how this plays out. You know, I, I guess. I'm just emotional about it, and I'd love to see the old guy do it, but boy, does he have a steep hill to climb. Anderson's last fight was against Derek Brunson, February 11th, 2017. So we're talking two years off. Two years. Well, 
talking against Israel Adesanya, who is basically a carbon copy of him, but not as cocky, yeah. I don't think, yeah. Not as cocky. Right, as a, car hmm. a, yeah, a carbon copy of him without the wear and tear, without the broken bones, without so many of the things, <laughs> without the inactivity, without the age, and Anderson had that skill that, uh, you know, kind of like a, a Roy Jones Jr. in boxing, you know, they, those guys that have that freakish talent that can do things no one else can, well, when they get old, it's usually not pleasant. All right. <clears throat> Here we got Ronnie Yaya, 26-9, and nine, fighting Ricky Simon, who's 14-1. and one. Dong Hyun Ma, 16-8-3, fighting Devontae Smith, who's 9-1. and one. Jim Crute, who is 9 and 0, fighting Sam, smiling Sam Alvey. He's 33 and 11, former guest of ours. We definitely should try to get him back on the show one of these days. Austin Arnett, also on the card, 16 and 5, fighting Shane Young, who's 12 and 4. Uh, female fight Montana De La Rosa, 9 and 4, fighting Nadia Kasim, 5 and 0. Raulian Paiva Frazé. 18 and 1 fighting Kai Kara France, who is 18 and 7. Taruto Ishihara, 10 6 and 2, fighting Kyung Ho Kang, who's 14 and 8. Lando Venata, 9 3 and 2, fighting Marcos Rosa Mariano, 6 and 4. And we got Jalen Turner in the second fight of the night, 7 and 4, fighting Callan Potter, who's 17 and 7. In the first fight of the night, Uligi Buren. Who is nine and five fighting Jonathan Martinez? Who's nine and two? Uligi, that's that's a first. I don't think I've ever seen that name. <laughs> and as for Bellator, we're coming uh, this week, uh, February 9th, Bellator here. Is that Saturday? February 9th? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it is. Saturday night fights for Bellator again. They're going to be doing this card from the UK. Tyne and Ware, England. Patricky Friere, otherwise known as Pitbull's brother. <laughs> he is uh, 28 and 6. 20 wins, 8 losses. And, no, no loss, no draws. 20 and 8. Fighting Ryan Scope, who is 10 and 1. And he is not the heir to a mouthwash company. He's a fighter. Scope. S C O P E. I don't think I've ever heard of this guy, but they're putting him up in the main event in England. Um, and they've got a guy in the co main event. They don't even have a picture out for sure, dog. Aaron Chalmers is going against Corey Browning, who's 3 and 1. Aaron Chalmers is 4 and 0, and I believe Chalmers is a guy that's in that show, Geordie Shore, or something like that. It's like a Jersey Shore spin off of the UK on MTV. So that makes sense to put him in the coming event of a UK fight. Uh, also, we have Fabian Edwards, 5 0, fighting Lee Chadwick, who's 24 13 and 1. Terry Brazier, 10 and 1, fighting uh, or Brazier. It's the Frazier. Brazier. 10 and 1, fighting Chris Bungard, who is 11 and 4. And we got Calvin Eleanor, fighting Nathan Grayson, owner 7 and 2. Grayson is 6 and 2. James Mulherin, 11-2, fighting Arunas Andreas Gevicus, who is 14-4. Lewis Long, 16-5, fighting Jim Wallhead, who is 29-11. It's a good name for a fighter, huh? Wallhead. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's not even his nickname. <laughs> That's his real name. All right, so that I'm not gonna go through the whole card. It's like 20 names, 20 fights long, and there's a bunch of no namers, no, no pictures. So that's your main Bellator cards for stuff you're gonna see on TV. Uh, and I believe we got one other piece to talk about here for news. Joe Rogan this week was uh, talking about how he, he uh, got into the position of the voice of the UFC. He says uh, on his podcast this week, I started in 1997. I was the post-fight interviewer. It was just a position that was available. The UFC was very small back then. Very few, few people knew what it was. It was off-off cable. 
you couldn't get it on cable, you could only get it on satellite, and they needed someone to do post-fight interviews. I was in the martial arts world, I used to teach martial arts for a living. Before I became a comedian, I used to fight, I fought a lot of Taekwondo tournaments, had some kickboxing fights, I'd always been a martial artist since I was a kid. I was just interested in watching the UFC, and then I started training Jiu-Jitsu, and when I was training in jiu-jitsu i was just a white belt i was just starting out that's when i got hired by the ufc to be a post-fight interviewer but i only did that for two years and then i quit it was just too much i was actually just i was actually losing money i would make more money doing a weekend at a comedy club than i would doing the ufc and it just got to a point where it was just too much of a pain in the ass so i still remained a fan but i backed away and then the ufc was purchased by this company named zuffa in 2001 when that happened and they started putting on shows in Vegas, and I would go there with my friends. They got me free tickets. They reached out. They would try and get celebrities to go sit there so that, because they were very small at the time, they were hemorrhaging money. They were trying to build it up. And in talking to Dana White, one day I was talking to him about fights going on in Japan. Do you know this guy? And I was bringing up all these names. Do you want to do commentary? I don't do commentary, man. I'm here to get drunk and watch people kick the shit out of each other. I'm not here to work. And he talked me into it for one show, UFC 137.5, whatever that means. Uh, it was a show that was on uh, one of those Fox Sports networks, one of the smaller networks. I did that, and the rest was history. I did like 12 of them for free. The UFC didn't have any money. They were hemorrhaging money. They were rich people that owned it, but it was not a profitable venture. And I said, look, just get me there. Get me and my friends tickets, and I'll do it. And that's how I operated for over a year. And then I I just became the commentator. It's just weird. <laughs> you know, his he, he mentions that for those early days. Yeah. Well, I think his, and I remember distinctly, his first show was in spring of uh, 97, UFC 13, when, and one of his early interviews was a drunken, angry Mark Coleman. <laughs> you know, what Coleman, what Coleman was mad about was one of his protégés, uh, wrestler Royce, Royce um, Alger, I think, uh, got knocked out uh, by by Eugene. I can't think. Of, oh, yeah, anyways, Colin was very upset, and he was had a fight coming with Maury Smith later that summer. And Colin was dropping f bombs, and Ray mm-hmm. had carried it, and he's kind of he looked like I get myself into. And Colin was just so upset, and you could almost see in the background there, given the cut signal. <laughs> 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 and, and I have this on a VH, VHS, but it's not on YouTube. Right? I send you guys a link. Well, I'll the tell you. Interview. What the craziest thing to see uh, in the old old footage of the UFC fights is uh, Brian Kilmeade from Fox News, like the guy that's in the, the morning shows, uh, the news, the you know twenty four hour Fox News. Uh, he used to do the post fight interviews too. Uh, even oh, before yeah, John Rowe. Yeah, yeah, he was classic. John Rowe <laughs> is coming forward with Judo and Sumo. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I didn't expect anyone to be an expert in those days, but it's Judo and Sumo. <laughs> and remember that, Judo and Sumo. <laughs> Ryan <Kincaid. laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. But yeah, that, uh, that Coleman interview, he says, Marty Smith, you better up and learn how to wrestle. Well, I went to that my goddamn game plan. I'm going to have him ground him and have him pound <laughs> him. And, you know, <laughs> he just kept going. And, uh, oh, 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 that was, we, we just, I had a bop at the house watching. We were just hysterical. Well, he got back there, it was just, it was just so long. I mean, there was just no, uh, they didn't even have Tank Abbott come, a drunken Tank Abbott coming out of the audience to commentate. And well, we just, used to, uh, we used to talk a lot with uh, Joe Rogan's best friend there, um, uh, mm-hmm. Joey Coco Diaz, or one of his best friends. Uh, and we used to have him on the show as a guy named Joey Karate. <laughs> he did these skits. Uh-huh. And, it was hilarious. And, and now Joey Coco Diaz is huge. Like, he, he's a big comedy star. Uh, so yeah. it's kind of funny. We I lost his number, but he he used to tell me like you know if I ever if if I'm ever in town or whatever you know and you got something going on, give me a call or whatever. So 
I had his number still at the, the, the time that um, we were calling him back and forth. Like, I think I had last talked to him, like, maybe a couple months before I went to a show in Boston. It was Joe Rogan headlining. And I had no idea Joey was touring with him. So Joey comes out, and I'm like, oh, man. I don't have my computer with me. I have no way to get in touch with him because it was all on Skype back then. I didn't have the cell phone going. And this is, this was probably about... 2007, 2008, I want to say. So, uh, I could have been backstage with Joe Rogan, but, you know, the closest I got to meeting him was when he had to actually address the story that I put on my blog, uh, saying that he, he, this was before I ended up going to his comedy show. Uh, so that would have been another interesting thing we could talk about, because he actually had to post something on his blog. This was back before he had his podcast. Uh, he, he had to post uh, something on his blog to say that he wasn't leaving the UFC because I had intercepted a word about a phone call that Dana White had with him where Dana White was going off on Joe Rogan because he had said that Mark uh, Cuban was a badass and, and you know he was trying to do something called HDNet fights at the time Mark Cuban and he was trying to get a hold of Randy Couture's contract and the UFC was fighting it so he was in court over that Mark Cuban and so Joe Rogan called him a badass, and then, like, two days later, Dana White gets a word of it, and he rips Joe Rogan a new one on the phone, and Joe pretty much gave his notice. This is what's the story I heard, that he was quitting the UFC. He wanted nothing to do with it anymore. Yeah, and that makes more sense now, because he, what he just said in that, that, that build-up was that he worked for free in the beginning, you know? How are you going to... Yeah. How are you going to tell a guy what to say who worked for free to put you on the map? You know, so obviously that would make him upset if you know they're trying to tell him he can't say sh bet good shit about the competitors. So they asked him a question and he answered it. It wasn't like he threw the UFC under the bus. He just spoke highly of the competitor. So anyway, the story goes that he gave his notice. So I put out this information that I had and it was very cryptic. But, you know, I said he's not going to be at the April 20th event, you know. Just happens to be 420, and if you're, you know, an enthusiast of the marijuana, that's a big day for those guys. So he wasn't going to be at the 420 event anyway, and so I posted it out there, and it looked suspicious to everybody, and then it turned out, oh, he's going to be at some festival doing a comedy show. So that's the real reason he wasn't going to be there, but he posted this big article denying that he was getting thrown, that he was leaving the UFC. So you got that much buzz. I think it was like 86,000 hits I got on that one day that that went live. <laughs> it was nuts. It was nuts. But I didn't get sued, so that's good. <laughs> and I, th I think that was really credible corroborating evidence. I, just, I think they smoothed it out. They had a second phone call after that first one. <laughs> What almost happened, due to a misunderstanding, I guess. All right, guys, well, I guess that's all we have for this week. And, uh, oh, 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 by the way, before I forget, we have confirmed with Murphy's Boxing, before his next fight, we will have Mark, the Italian Bazooka DeLuca, on our broadcast. Ah, cool. <laughs> but I don't think he's calling himself the Italian Bazooka anymore. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, you know, talking about going down memory lane, boy, that's going back before college, uh, talking about his dad, his dad was the first one to give me a boxing lesson when I walked into the McKean Post, so I'm sure uh, we'll have fun talking about that, <coughs> um, I wonder if they're still doing that, actually, be interesting to find out, but anyway, that's all she wrote, and, uh, great job, guys, thanks for stopping by and giving us all your insight. Alright, well, sounds great. I'll send you guys the link to that, um, show, with available hopefully next week, and, um, then we'll go, and I'll send you some uh, updates on the fights tomorrow night. Awesome. Alright, bud. Let's enjoy the fights. Enjoy, especially to you. You'll be there live. <laughs>